Hi, this is Miss Linton, and this is seventh period review of chapter 45, Community and Ecosystem Ecology. Say hi. Hi. All right. That was really exciting. All right. So, first thing I want to talk about is yay, community. Um, what is a community, by the way? Multiple populations living together, excellent. And when we study them, it just we can't just say here's a list of them because what do we really need to know? The what of each? The niche. The, okay, yes, that's very helpful. The niche. The niche is their what? Job. Habitat is where they live. And we need to know the density of each, right? And we know that one species can influence another species, right? Okay, so when we study them, we need to look at the diversity that we have, the composition of those species. So to do an analysis, oftentimes they start by using an island. So think back when we talked about this. If I was looking for the greatest biodiversity, where would my island be? How big would it be? And how close would it be to a mainland? Think about that. Big, close to the mainland, and what else? What else did we learn later on? Where do we have the greatest richness, the greatest biodiversity? Near the equator or away from the equator? Near the equator. Why do you think that is? It's warmer. It's it's warmer. More direct energy, yeah. Yeah, more energy, so you can have more, if you have more light energy, you can have more what? Photosynthesis, Photosynthesis right? That can support more... <coughs> Tell me that what are what are those? What are their pro producers, which can support more consumers. consumers? Good. All right. So that's what they learned, and so then we apply that when we when we look we we looked at the number of species, we looked at rate of extinction, and then we compared those, and we saw a large island closest to the mainland is where we can have the greatest biodiversity. And when we study um, communities, or when we try to preserve communities then we want to have as large an area as possible because we know every time we fragment it, right, and we create those edges, it's like creating small little islands and those cannot support as much life. So we know the difference between a habitat and a niche, habitat where you live, niche the job that you have. And we talked about that there are different kinds of species, a generalist and a specialist. Do you remember this part? Okay. Um, which one could be more susceptible to ex extinction? Specialist. Yeah. Because any slight change in their environment can make it so that they cannot um, live in that particular area. Though there is some flexibility, we talked about two different kinds of niches, the fundamental and then the realized, where it really does live and where it can live. Um, and remember, you're going to try to decrease, as an organism, decrease as much overlap as possible because wherever you have overlap, you're going to have what? Competition. Okay. And we know there's something that says no two species can occupy the exact same niche. What's that called? The competitive exclusion principle. Remember that? Isn't that this chapter? Yeah. Am I talking ahead? No, it's correct. Oh, okay. All right. So competition, when two different species want the same thing, though we talked about in population ecology that we could be the same species and want the same thing. I could want her water, and she wants her water, and I could try to get that water from her, right? Do you need me later? I'll come back. Okay. okay. All right. Um, and then, so you can compete within your population, um, but when you two different species compete, the competitive exclusion principle is saying one's going to win, one's going to lose. So one's going to live, one's going to die. Or what could you do? Resource, what is it called? Resource partition. You need to be comfortable with those terms. Okay? So a niche is what you do. And then from that, you want to think, okay, no two species can occupy the exact same niche, right? Because one's going to live, one's going to die. Um, so that competitive exclusion principle says that. So what's another option besides life and death is split that niche up in some way. Okay, exploit a slightly different area of it. You, we both want to live on this branch, but I'll live on the top of the leaves, and you live on the bottom of the leaves. Okay, that would be an example of resource partitioning. Or I'll eat the new leaves and you eat the That's resource partitioning. You can live at the bottom of the cave. I'll live at the top of the cave. Resource partitioning, which decreases competition. Now, if you have those differences, right, the adaptation for living at the top of the cave is going to be different than the adaptations for living at the bottom of the cave, right? Mm -hmm. So what can that lead to? Speciation. Speciation. Yeah. 
Yeah, divergent evolution, is that what you're gonna say? Yeah, so you, this can lead to, I have to have adaptations that make me better adapted to live at the top of the cave, and I'm living at the bottom of the cave, I need some different adaptations. So those are the adaptations that are gonna be selected for, right? Okay, so then I'm just trying to link all of those concepts together. We looked at examples of resource, pro oh, here's an example, live, live death. Here, uh, um, we looked at resource partitioning, resource partitioning, and here's an example, okay? And so as it changes slightly, it's called character displacement. So I did have this size beak, now I have a little bit bigger beak, because I can eat the bigger seeds, but a little bit smaller <coughs> beak, I can eat the smaller seeds. And that's adaptive radiation, and that's what happened on the Glasgow Sun. Okay. Can you go through the fundamental realized? Yes, I can. When you hear the word realized, what does that make you think of? What's another word for realized? Maybe actual? Yeah. yeah. So I have a whole range of conditions in which I can survive, right? But where do I really survive at? At this range right here. And it's possible this bird could live here and here and here, but where does he actually live? He just lives right here in this one location. Just okay? Just if you go for a minute, let him see what's happening. Because you got oh, okay. No problem. All right. And then... Um, then we started talking about predator-prey relationships. And um, be thinking in your head, I'm gonna have a few of you, if you know there's something you're involved in the school, have you talk just for a minute, okay? Real quick and I'll interrupt this. Um, we talked about the cycling of predator-prey relationships and then we looked at the lynx and the hare because that is one that's a typical one that's brought up. Now, what are re reasons why the hare population might go down? Yes? Because the lynx eats too much. The lynx ate too much, right? So it overshot its carrying capacity. What's another reason why the lynx number might come down? Yes? Their own food source. Their own food source could have been a drought. Okay, and I'm gonna pause just for a minute. Sorry, little tour group there. Okay, so lynx and hare, we talked about predator prey, and then we just went into all the different um, uh, prey defenses that we looked at, right? Uh, oh, coevolution, let's make sure we note that word. Two different species pressure the other and push one another. Um, then we just went into, you remember the mimicry that we looked at? I don't think you need me on that, right? You feel pretty comfortable. The only ones I need to really talk to you about, and I probably skipped today, is it Batesian and Malaria mimicry? Yeah. Okay, so the way I remember that, Batesian, take the bait. I am tasty. Um, you could eat me, I wouldn't poison you. Take the bait, you know? I look like a bee. I'm really, I thought I'd seen her, really, but I don't. Whereas Malaria mimicry, the way I remember, you're welcome to that. Malarian mimicry, I think the two L's in malarian, stinga, stinga, and so those two stingers can hurt you. That's how our malarian mimic is. I've got a stinger, you've got a stinger, and we can tag team them and increase the learning curve by being the same color. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, then we did that, that, that. Then we just talked about symbiotic relationships, and so I'm gonna just jump to the end on that and go here. Okay, and what would be the same about all symbiotic relationships? Benefits at least one. Benefits me, super bad for you. Parasitism, good for me, you don't care. Commensalism, Commensalism good for both of us. So you need to read the example that I give you, and I, you know, if somebody dies or is eaten, that's definitely bad, okay? If it doesn't impact the other one in any way, then it's gonna be commensalism. If both benefit, right? You provide shelter, I'll provide food. Okay, then that would be mutualism. So just read it. The only reason I mention this is because somebody or t one or two of you missed it in class when I asked one question, I think, so it just made me a little nervous. All right. Um, next, um, we talked about looking at continental drift, and the point here that I want you to see is that we can look that we know about continents moving, and we have evidence for that. Like we can look at fossil trends and how it's continuous from one continent to another, and if it was Pangaea, you could see that continuity right here. But the idea is that <clears throat> um, as an area changes, right, as that area changes or that a continent shifts to a new place, obviously the pressures to live in that area is gonna vary as well, right? Okay, and then, um, we looked at disturbances. Are all disturbances bad? No. no. What was the conclusion? We looked at Yellowstone to make this claim. What was the conclusion about disturbances? They need some disturbance. Need some disturbance. And what about frequency? 
Not a lot, not super frequent, but not completely not infrequent. Yeah, just a little bit, you know. Occasional frequency helps, um, and those disturbances can kind of clean up that area um, a little bit. And we looked at when they change, um, that change in, it could change because maybe the, the continent shifted. It could change because one species is providing more nutrients in the soil, which allows another species to live there. Um, but that is called ecological succession. And we looked at several different models, but we said if that succession starts on bare rock, it's going to be called what? Primary, Primary succession. Because you, you're starting with rock, that's going to take longer because you've got to break the rock down into soil, right? But secondary succession is going to happen more rapidly because it already has soil. soil. Yeah. Okay? And that could happen as a result of a fire or you're abandoning in an area or something like that. Um, we looked at several different models about succession. We looked that you will have more species the closer you are to the, more species diversity the closer you are to the equator. We looked at that different species can tolerate different conditions. But we said predominantly what you find is that um, chance plays a big role, you know, not just the, you know, the uh, temperature and rainfall, right, the amount of rain, right, because if you don't have enough rain, you can't have trees, right, and if you're really lacking in rain, you're going to, it's very, very infrequent, you might have a desert, right, um, so it's rainfall and it's temperature, but chance has a big, is a big component of what species survive in what area. And that was the individualistic model. Think of the individual. What individual species got there and took hold? It's not a foregone conclusion. Now, if you are in a chaparral environment, like here in Oak Park, and um, somebody comes and it, there's a fire that comes through, chances are you're going to have another chaparral environment develop in that area. Why? Those are the seeds that are available to it. Right? You might have some grasses early on, but due to competition, then you're going to get some, some thicker branches growing out and shading out the grass and then the grass will be gone. But um, you'll probably return to that because that's all that's in that area. Okay, and then dynamics. Okay, so then we looked at an ecosystem. We're looking at the communities that are there and the environment and how it influences it. And we talked about that there are different components and I think this part is kind of easy cheesy. Um, autotrophs and easy cheesy, easy peasy, <laughs> lemon squeezy. <laughs> I threw some cheese in there too. As long as we have crackers. Um, autotrophs <laughs> and heterotrophs. What is another way for autotroph? Another name for autotroph? Producer. Producer. Okay. And then what's another name for heterotroph? Consumer. Now we have levels of consumer, right? What's a primary consumer? What do they eat? Yeah, herbivores, they're eating plants, right? And a secondary consumer could eat a primary consumer. What would we, what's another name for a secondary consumer? Carnivore. Carnivore. Yeah, the primary consumer would be an herbivore and a secondary consumer would be a carnivore. A tertiary consumer is still a carnivore, but it's eating another yes. carnivore. Yeah, and then you, and we don't keep going much beyond three, four, maybe five, because each time that energy, remember the laws of thermodynamics, the first law says energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can just trans, yes, transform, but the second one says you lose energy, usually as what each time? Heat. So how much generally gets passed on each time? Only 10%, so you run out of energy that you can actually use. Yes? So is that saying like when an animal eats another animal, like they get 10% Well, I would just say if some bear came and ate me, right? I could be a good meal for a bear, right? But if you look at all the food that has gone into me in my 51 years, he's not getting all of that. Not all that energy that went into me is actually getting consumed by the bear. A very small percentage is actually getting consumed by the bear. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the 10% of your end? Gets passed on to the next oh, okay. one. Okay. So like when you eat a cow, all the food and grain that went into that cow you know, let's say you had a set amount, 10 bags of grain that get given to that cow, right? 
that you're not getting all 10 bags of grain nutrient-wise from the cow. You're getting about how many bags of grain of nutrients? One. One. So that means those nine bags of grain that went to sustain that cow to that point doesn't get passed on to the next level. And that's why people would say, if we want to sustain the earth, eat lower on the food chain. Eat at the grain level, not at the cow level. Because at the cow level, we could sustain so many other people with those remaining nine bags of grain than just keeping the cow alive so we can kill the cow. And it's like over their whole lifespan. Yes, their lifespan, yeah. Over their whole lifespan, okay? So then we looked, there also, we looked at that not all, uh, you don't need light to, for the beginning of every food chain. Um, you, could, you could be in uh, um, a hydrothermal vent that you could have nutrients from. We looked at caves, we looked at detrital food chains where you're starting with you know, poop, pee, dead things. We looked at all the things herbivores can eat. We looked at the things that carnivores can eat. Um, and then we are known as what? Omnivores. Omnivores. Um, and we looked at um, decomposers, and they work on every level. And then we said, let's look, and we talked about how energy will flow, right? But nutrients will cycle. And um, we said you could look at a single food chain like this. It's just a single pathway of food. But a food web is more representative because um, this, this caterpillar is gonna could go to several different organisms as a food source. And we said food webs are very complex. Um, we talked about stacking them up, and we would stack them up into um, pyramids. And we talked about how the pyramid at the bottom, we could say, well, numbers. You know, there's more blades of grass than there are zebras. There's more zebras than there are lions. But it doesn't always apply when you have one tree housing millions of insects. Um, so then you could say, well, mass. I will mass the tree. It's going to weigh more than all the insects. And that, that's true. But there are still exceptions to those pyramids as well because sometimes at the bottom of the food chain, that phytoplankton is producing a whole lot of energy for um, that you can have a small number of phytoplankton supporting a large amount of zooplankton. Um, those are the pyramids. Here's your 10%. So we said... This isn't an accurate pyramid. One, it doesn't show decomposers, right? Two, it should be more steep. And then we went through our cycles. That was how we ended it. The water cycle, I think you just look at your keywords on that. You should be all right. Um, I think you're fine with your, and how man screws it up with pollution, carbon, right? And we know that when we look at this, there's only one thing that removes carbon dioxide out of the environment, and that is what? photosynthesis and then we tie that into global warming yeah and melting of the polar ice caps and ice sheets yeah and extreme weather I'm sure it doesn't happen and then um, I'm sure that's all just fake news and then um, we talked about the um, that's sarcasm um, and then we talked about the phosphorus cycle that's a sedimentary cycle and that the it's um, tied up in rocks and then erosion and stuff um, will bring it out of those rocks, and then we tie that into algal blooms because it's a limiting factor. It keeps algae in check. So all of a sudden, if you have a whole bunch of it, and the only reason we have a whole bunch of it is because man threw it into the environment, and when that happens, you get algal blooms, and there's consequences for algal blooms. Even though it's a phototroph, even though it does photosynthesis and generates oxygen, there's not enough nutrients to sustain that massive algal bloom. They die, who works on them? decomposers and then the decomposers break them down since they do cellular respiration since they're a heterotroph they suck all the oxygen out of the lake and it causes a massive fish kill yes um, for the fish we examine in general do you need to know like the specifics of the cycle or just in like a general sense kind of thing i would know it as much as i taught it to you okay yeah but i would also know man's um role in that cycle okay Okay, and then the last one is the nitrogen cycle. Would you like to do that together? Plus, it's on my website if you Google it, on my YouTube. Okay, here we go. So nitrogen, the reservoir is in the air. Nitrogen fixation, and we take nitrogen gas and convert it into ammonia. Who does it? Nitrogen fixing bacteria. And ammonia is kind of toxic, so we better do some nitrification. Oh, I am there. Um, first. <laughs> Nitrite, NO2 minus, okay. 
Okay, then nitrate, NO3 minus, so we can serve this up to plants. Okay, now another way we can get nitrate is, what is that? Light and heat, and that's atmospheric fixation or industrial fixation, which is usually too much of this, acid rain. Okay, so now, what? Yes. So once we have the nitrate, we can serve this up to plants, and then animals can eat the plants, and when the animals and the plants die, decomposers work on them, and they bring it back into ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and then how can we return it to the atmosphere? Denitrification. Yay. And there's a video of me doing that. Okay, if you just Google nitrogen cycle. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Any, remember when we talked about, think about it this way, carbon fixation. That's the, when you take CO2 out of the air and you make it a solid. When you take nitrogen and make it a solid, it's nitrogen fixation. But nitrification is purposely different bacteria than our nitrogen fixation. It's taking a solid and converted into another solid. Another solid. That's different. Yeah. What else? Yes. Into, which isn't, you know, which is most of the gases we breathe and totally unhelpful for us. Okay, and that is it. Good job, even with the tour group. Yay, good job, you guys. Is there anything else you want me to do? No? Okay, have a piece of toast.